name's Andrew. I'm from London, and I think I have a story you might be interested in. So, my dad used to be a builder, and in his mid-twenties, he moved into a single-bedroom flat with his then-girlfriend in a place called Muswell Hill in London. The flat was in a house share, which is basically a big old house that's been chopped up into individual flats that took up each floor of the house. My dad and his girlfriend lived on the second floor, and his neighbors in the flats above and below were friendly enough, but with it being London, they pretty much kept to themselves and minded their own business. Then, one day in early 83, he noticed that the plumbing in his flat was playing up, so he called a plumbing company to come out and unblock the drains. When the plumber arrived, my dad was the one who answered the house's front door to him, and after a quick inspection of the plumbing in his flat, he determined that the problem was probably the drains on the exterior of the property. This was bad news for my dad as it meant that it wasn't going to be an instant fix. Then, lo and behold, the main exterior sewer drain was the problem, as it was almost completely blocked with something. My dad says he told the plumber that he'd hoped it wasn't anything particularly disgusting blocking the drain, i.e. poo, and around about that same time they were discussing what it was, the quiet Scottish neighbor who lived in the attic flat came down to see what the problem was. He'd also made calls to a plumbing company but couldn't find anyone to come out, so he thanked my dad for getting the problem sorted. That's when the plumber found the drain was blocked with bits of fat and small bones, and because the fat had congealed with the bones in there, he'd have to come back in the morning with more specialist equipment to get the blockage sorted. My dad said this was fair enough, but that he was getting really sick and tired of the problem as it was causing a bad smell in his flat and his girlfriend was basically threatening to move out if it didn't get sorted out. Anyway, the plumber said it looked like someone was flushing food waste instead of binning it, and the Scottish neighbor, who said his name was Des, said it looked like chicken bones. Everyone was tutting and shaking their head, assuming it was the people on the ground floor that were too lazy to take their bins out or whatever, so they were flushing takeaway leftovers down the toilet. After that, the plumber departed after promising he'd be back in the morning to sort the blockage. But that night, my dad said he'd heard banging and scraping sounds coming from the front yard of the house share, and when he poked his head out the window, Des was out there, wearing nothing but a vest and shorts, and he was clearing out the drains himself. My dad said that he thought that he was mad as a hatter being out there at night in just a vest when it was bloody freezing, but then again, he was Scottish, and he reckoned that they were better suited to cold weather than the English are. My dad called down to Des, telling him he was an absolute hero and for getting the drains sorted as he was sick of the smell. Des agreed and said it would probably be cheaper all round if he just got it unstuck himself. By his own admission, my dad said he didn't think too much about why Des might be doing that, or why he might not want anyone paying too much attention to the bones and fat that clogged the drains up. Anyway, the next morning, the plumber shows up again and my dad informs him that Des has dealt with the blockage during the night. It was only then that it really hit him how suspicious that was, doing something for free that a plumber got paid a few hundred quid to do. The plumber decided to double check anyways, just to make sure it was all dealt with, and as much as Des has done a pretty decent job of clearing the pipes out, he'd left a few scraps of bone and fat behind. My dad remembers leaving for work as the plumber was collecting up some of the bones and fat into a little plastic baggie he normally used for spare fittings, and as he drove off into the misty London morning, he says he thought to himself, Maybe I should look for another place to live. A few days later, my dad got home from work and as he got out of his car, two blokes approached him and asked if his name was Dennis. My dad said no and asked who the two blokes were. When they told him they were policemen, he got a really, really bad feeling. The two policemen then asked if he lived with a bloke named Dennis and my dad said no but there was a Scottish man named Desmond living in the attic flat. He said the two coppers gave each other this look, then asked what time Desmond normally got home. My dad said usually about an hour after him, and if they waited, they'd probably catch Des when he arrived home from work. 
It's so creepy to hear him tell the story at that part because as he got into the flat, his girlfriend was just about ready to leave for her shift in a nearby pub. He actually looked her dead in the eye and said, I think Des has been killing people. Then told her about getting stopped by the police and promised to call her if there were any developments. And my God, were there fast developments. My dad said he basically hung around the window until he saw that Des had arrived home, then watched as the two coppers approached him, had a quiet chat, and then Des walked them into the house and up to his flat. Not long after, they walked Des about to the police car and drove him off. Des never returned to the house at Cranley Gardens, the road the house share was on, and he was later charged with multiple murders, but not under the name Des. That was just a fake name he was giving people. God knows why, but his real name, and some of your viewers might have figured this out by now, was Dennis Nilsson. Between the late 70s and the day he was arrested in 1983, Dennis murdered at least 12 young men and boys, some of them while my dad and his girlfriend were asleep in the flat below. He ended up getting sentenced to life in prison and ended up dying there too, though I'm not 100% sure when and why he passed away. Obviously, my dad was quick to get out of that flat, as knowing that those bad smells weren't the sewer drains and were something else haunted him horribly. His girlfriend ended up leaving him as she just wanted to get away from all the memories of that place. He says that was hard on him, but it was a weird kind of blessing in disguise, because if she hadn't dumped him to move on with her life, he'd never have met my mom a few years later. It's not a story he tells very often for obvious reasons, and he didn't tell me or my sister until we were both adults who'd left home. But as you can imagine, our jaws were on the floor when he told us, and it's pretty horrifying to think that my dad was a close part of how Dennis ended up getting nicked. I've actually watched a few documentaries on the Nilsson murders, and it's surreal to hear about the second floor neighbor's involvement as every time I think, that's my dad. I have a scary story that happened to me a few years ago involving the sewers here in Los Angeles. I know that might sound too gross to be on your channel, but I promise, I've tried to keep this as clean as possible. So a few years back when I was 15 years old, I joined my family on an Easter Sunday picnic over in Griffith Park, while the younger kids did the Easter hunt, me and my three cousins went off to go play soccer. I'm more into baseball personally, so I got bored pretty quick. We then went off looking for something else to entertain us. After a while, we ended up finding an abandoned building on the edge of the park. And after being dared, I climbed over the fence. My cousins quickly joined me, and we started playing a game of tag around the abandoned building. But then my dumbass wasn't paying attention to where I was going. And as I was running on the old floorboards, I felt a piece of wood beneath me break. What followed was falling almost 30 feet of empty space below me. And I ended up falling into the LA sewers. The first thing I felt was water. Really fast running water. It was like being on a water slide, but with a concrete bottom. And instead of the water being all fresh and warm like in a water park... It smelled nasty. I tried to get my phone out of my pocket, knowing that it would probably be ruined, but hoping that I could still use the flashlight. But the water was running so fast, and I was so frightened that the phone was whipped out of my hand the moment it came out of my pocket. I tried to grab it, but I lost my footing, and that's when I started slip sliding downward. I honestly thought I was going to die. But suddenly I was able to grab onto a pipe and find my footing again. When I put my hands on the walls, they were all cold and slimy, and the water was up to my knees when I stood up. But all I could hear was my own voice echoing back at me, and the sound of rushing water. I was so scared that I could feel a lump in my throat, like I was about to burst into tears. Can you blame me? I was in the dark, alone not knowing if I was ever going to see my family again. I realized my only option was to carry on through the pipe and find a way out, but it looked so menacing. 
that I decided it was better to stay put and hope that someone would find me. I don't know how much time passed, but I was there for a while. I started to feel hungry and thirsty, but obviously I couldn't drink any of the water, or I probably would have died. For the first time in my life, I was actually praying to God. Not like in school or church, when you're just going through the notions and nodding along before chiming in with Amen. I was praying from my soul, saying out loud, Please, please get me out of here. What followed was like a miracle unfolding in real time. I had to strain my ears at first, but I distinctly remember hearing the sound of helicopters flying really close above me. It suddenly hit me that people were actually looking for me. It was one of the best feelings I've ever felt. But then after another long period of time, I started to worry that they would not find me and that I wasn't going to be rescued. I tried to relax, telling myself just to wait, but it was actually 12 hours before I saw the light above me and I heard someone shout, Here's the kid! And a rope got lowered down with a platform at the bottom of it. So I held on to it and they pulled me out through a manhole. I felt disoriented when I came to the surface, but I was finally safe. I can't really even put into words how good that felt. I was by a freeway with all of these flashing lights. They gave me a phone and I called my mom. Hey mom, I'm okay. Where are you at? You need to come get me. She began crying and saying, Oh my god, where are you? I remembered firefighters pulling my filthy shirt off. Then they hoisted me down and wrapped me in a plastic sheet. And then they gave me a change of clothes and they put me on an IV drip since I was severely dehydrated. After a couple of hours, the doctor told me that I was fine. All I had was a few grazes on my knees and knuckles from the fall. When I got home, my entire family was waiting for me. I also remember seeing news reporters outside of my house waiting to interview me, which seemed a bit weird, but I suppose I had no idea what a big story this was, a kid going missing and all. I found out later that after I fell into a pipe, my cousins ran back to my mom. It took a long time to find me because I had traveled a mile from where I fell, all that rushing water and slipping and sliding. I also found out that the fire department had sent cameras down to look for me. They only found me because a camera picked up my handprints on a pipe, handprints made in raw sewage. When I found out that there were over 60 people involved in the search, I remembered feeling really bad because I had caused all this drama, but also happy that they hadn't given up on me. I later heard that there were toxic gases down there, so I was actually way more lucky to be alive than I thought. I got to take a week off from school afterward, but after that I was kind of glad to be back. I just wanted things to get back to normal. Sometimes in my mind I go back to that moment when I fell and think about what would have happened if they had never found me. When I do, I always thank God that I got another chance. My name is Trevor. I live here in my hometown of Raleigh, North Carolina, and today I want to tell you about my encounter with a real-life alien. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. This guy either has an overactive imagination, or he's totally nuts. But please, hear me out. I'm like 90% sure you won't be disappointed. So, the thing is, I'm a sewer utility line mechanic here in Raleigh, North Carolina. I know, it's just a dumb, fancy way of saying sewer worker, but at this point, I'll take whatever dignity I can get. I joke, of course, because I'm actually kind of proud of what I do. If it wasn't for folks like me... All that stuff you want to stay flushed would suddenly start becoming unflushed, and nobody wants that. Anyway, back when I was still a rookie mechanic, I used to have to go down into the sewers with my foreman so he could basically show me the ropes. Let me tell you, you don't really know if you're brave or not until you climb down into the sewers and wade through waist-deep toxic waste for hours at a time. I was kind of intimidated by the idea of it, and... I'll admit, I only got into being a line mechanic because I needed the money. But good God, 
Actually climbing down into the darkness the first few times seriously rustled my jimmies. The first few times my foreman took the lead and I just followed, watching everything that he did, taking mental notes and letting him walk me through the process of checking lines and probing for fat deposits. It was gross, and it never stops being gross. But after about three or four runs, it stopped being so terrifying and started feeling a lot more like hard work. But then, I started having to take the lead to demonstrate what I'd learned, as well as getting myself some more practical experience. The fear came back a little once that all started happening, but it was more the pressure of actually performing up to standard that was making me anxious. I was still in a probationary period for a few months and I was worried that if I messed up too much, I'd be fired almost as quick as I started. But as nerve-wracking as the whole training process was, I had no idea of the kind of messed up stuff I'd see down in the sewers. And one of those things absolutely terrified me, and is probably the closest thing I'll ever see to a legitimately otherworldly alien being. I remember turning down one of the shorter tunnels on our route and as my flashlight's beam hit the sharp outer corner, I saw something move. This grabbed my attention for two reasons. Number one, obviously we get plenty of rats down in the sewers, but they're long gone before you get close because you make a ton of noise when you wade through the water. So like, you hear them skittering around, which is creepy enough, but you tend not to ever see them unless it's at a distance. Number two, the thing was not only unlike anything I'd ever seen in my life, it actually reacted to the light of my flashlight and sort of tensed up. Okay, so that's kind of a lie when I said that I'd never seen anything like it because I had, only it was in a bunch of different sci-fi and horror movies, so you can imagine why it scared the life out of me to see it with my own eyes. What I saw was shaped like a human heart, kind of the same size too, wider at the top and kind of narrower at the bottom. It reminded me of a heart too, not just from the way it tensed and relaxed, but from the way it was pure blood red. It wasn't beating like a heart though. It only ever tensed up when my flashlight passed over it and that's how I knew that what I was looking at was somehow alive. Plus, the way it was reacting to my light kind of made it change shape too, like it was scared of the light. I think I stared at it in disbelief for a second or two before finally whispering like, Bob, what in God's name is that? I moved my flashlight over it again a few times, showing my foreman how it wasn't just the ball of fleshy gunk that was moving. The thing that was attaching to the walls was twitching too. He was definitely freaked out because he let out a whispered, My God. Poor choice of words on his part, seriously, because I figured he'd never seen anything like it before, and that had me even more scared than I had been before. Turns out, he had seen something like it before, and he actually knew exactly what it was too, he'd just never seen one as big as that before. I really wish he told me earlier because I swear to god I almost had a heart attack, but after promising me that the whole thing was safe and wasn't some kind of dark souls monster, I finally got a hold of myself and pushed past the thing. My heart was literally trying to jump out of my chest and I found I couldn't even look at it as I got closer because my legs just stopped working. But eventually I got past it and finished the run without passing out or getting eaten or absorbed. Okay, now I bet you're pretty desperate to know just what in God's name I saw by now, so I'll just go ahead and tell you. What I was looking at was a cocoon of Tubifex worms. They're like these little blood-red worms who are somehow both male and female, and when they breed, they breed in these big colonies that then form these blood-red egg sacs. I'm probably getting that wrong in some way, so biology nerds, please don't at me, but I swear I've never seen anything so alien-looking and scary in my whole entire life. Stuff like that reminds me of some old YouTube video I watched once where the theme was like, we live on an alien planet. There's stuff out there that's actually real that's just as freaky as anything some Hollywood horror movie producer could ever dream up. And to me, 
that little fact is enough to lose sleep over. On the outskirts of the German city of Frankfurt lies a small sewer outlet. Known as the Lederbach Tunnel by residents, the outlet sits underneath an overpass and has a narrow, dimly lit walkway running through it. Even in daylight hours, the outlet has a rather ominous look about it, but its foreboding appearance isn't the only reason it's developed a sinister reputation among the locals. In days gone by, the outlet's walkway provided something of a shortcut between nearby residential areas and adjacent playgrounds. But since 1998, the tunnel has been blocked off to all but city sewage workers. Urban legends abound regarding the reasons for this, and although some of them are decidingly melodramatic, they're very much based on a true story. A story so utterly harrowing that, for 20 years, it continues to chill the blood of all those who hear. Of the Lederbach Phantom March 26th of 1998 was the final day of school before Easter break, and 13-year-old Tristan Brubach was in no mood to attend. He attempted to convince his father that he had hurt his back, but his father was no fool. He knew Tristan loathed the routine and responsibility of education and forced him to depart for classes. However, around lunchtime, Tristan tried giving the same excuse to one of his teachers. He must have given a convincing performance because this teacher gave him permission to finish school early at approximately 1.30 p.m. Tristan then made his way to the Frankfurt Hoost train station, intent on returning home to get an early start on the Easter break. This particular train station is one of the busiest in the whole city, but despite the dense crowds, Tristan appeared on CCTV footage, visiting a small store inside the station itself. The footage showed him to be alone, and he was still alone when sighted a short time later by a woman walking her dog through a nearby park. Tristan was sat on a park bench, puffing on a cigarette that he most likely purchased from the store in the train station, and when the woman passed him, Tristan leaned down to pet her dog a few times. The pair exchanged words, with the woman later saying that Tristan was a cheeky but charming young man. And then as she walked away, she looked back to shoot him a warm, motherly smile. It's then that she saw two dark-haired men approaching Tristan before engaging him in conversation. This was the last time that anyone would see Tristan alive. Around 5 p.m., a group of children were walking home from school and happened to pass through the Lederbach Tunnel walkway. It was then that they sighted something floating in the filthy, shallow water. It's a human corpse. Tristan's corpse. Not knowing who else to turn to, the children rushed back to school to inform their teacher of what they'd seen. Apparently, their teacher believed that they were simply making the whole thing up and insisted on accompanying the children to the Lederbach Tunnel to confirm their story. To their horror, they discovered that every word the children said was true. There really was a young boy's corpse floating in the sewer, and upon making the discovery themselves, they rushed to inform the police. Frankfurt police officers would later describe the crime scene as one of the worst they'd faced in their entire careers. Tristan's body was in such a terrible state that the officers could only identify him via a name tag inside the boy's school bag. After reconstructing the crime at the scene, investigators deducted that Tristan had been beaten to a pulp before being strangled just meters from where he was found. They also determined that Tristan had tried to fend off his attackers, as one of his shoes had come off during the supposed struggle. There's also a chance that the strangling didn't actually kill Tristan, because whoever had attacked him had followed him into the water before cutting his throat from ear to ear. The cut was so deep that Tristan was almost beheaded, and his killer followed up by plunging the blade into his torso over and over again. After that, the real mutilation began. Sections of flesh from Tristan's arms and legs had been removed, and the killer had taken the time to remove certain appendages from the boy's body. The police noted that an ear was missing, along with a few of his fingers and toes, and since none of these were found at the crime scene, 
as thought the killer removed them as trophies of his grisly act. News of Tristan's brutal murder horrified the local community, and their eyes were glued to TV news in the days that followed as the police investigation unfolded. Frankfurt had a relatively low crime rate at the time, and murders like Tristan's were almost unheard of. As you can imagine, his family was absolutely devastated. His only surviving relatives were his grandmother and his father, Bernd. And since Tristan had no siblings, the Brubach bloodline had essentially been wiped from the earth. On top of that, Tristan's mother had taken her own life just three years prior, and the two deaths in quick succession condemned Bernd to a grief that he never recovered from. Tristan's funeral was attended by hundreds of local citizens, some of which had never even met him. And as Frankfurt grieved for the rebellious but charming young man, the police investigation continued. German homicide detectives announced that Tristan's murder and mutilation had taken no longer than 15 minutes, and that through the course of their preliminary investigation, they'd found their first major clue. A single bloody footprint had been found at the scene of the crime, and the size suggested that it belonged to the killer. This would prove their single biggest chance at identifying the murderer, but they still sought out eyewitness statements in order to tighten the net around the bloodthirsty child killer. One statement came from three who had been walking to a nearby soccer field at around 3.30pm. They claimed that as they passed within about a mile of the Liederbach Tunnel, they spotted an odd-looking man with dark hair walking away from the area at speed. They also told the police that the man appeared to be soaking wet from the waist down, leading police to theorize that this was none other than Tristan's killer. This sighting was then corroborated by a young woman who had also been in the area at the time of the murder. She too had spotted a man whose pants and shoes looked sodden as they had been wading in deep water, and the two sightings helped paint a physical description of the man believed to be Tristan's murderer. The man was said to have a long, scruffy blonde beard with a small plate braided into one side. He was also thought to be very skinny and very pale with light-colored eyes while standing at around 5 foot 7 inches tall. Witnesses also mentioned he looked grimy as if he was averse to bathing and that he either had a hair lip or a very deep scar just below his left nostril. Police then consulted a criminal psychology profiler who told them that the suspect was most likely between 25 and 35 years old and had no close friends or family and most probably harbored some kind of perverse attraction or resentment towards children. This profiler also stated that there was a big chance that Tristan knew his killer in some capacity and that the police factored many of these estimations into their investigation in the weeks that followed. Yet barely a week after Tristan's funeral, there was a shocking development in the case that left even the most hardened investigators shaken. On April 7th of 1998, Frankfurt police received a call from a payphone located in the Hoosht train station, and the very same train station Tristan had been sighted in just hours before he was murdered. A police dispatcher answered the call, and when they asked the caller to identify themselves, the caller simply replied, this is Tristan's murderer speaking, and told the officer they wished to turn themselves in. When asked to describe themselves, the caller told the officer he was a 5 foot 11 inches with long black hair, a detail which contradicted the more recent eyewitness statements, but lined up with the dog walker's description of the two men that approached Tristan while he was smoking on the park bench. The supposed killer then stated nothing but arrest me then ended the call. Police officers rushed to the train station but failed to apprehend the caller, and due to how busy the Hoost train station was, they were unable to identify the caller from CCTV footage or get accurate fingerprints from any of the payphones. When this new piece of information reached the media, some journalists speculated that the killer was trying to confuse investigators by providing contradictory information but failed to note that the dog walker seemed to provide this exact same description of the suspect. In addition to this, when police released the audio of the call to the general public, many noted that the caller sounded distant and intoxicated. This could have easily been because the call was a prank formulated by mean-spirited drunks, 
but it also lined up with some description of the killer as pale, scruffy, and unwashed, potentially lining up with someone with addiction problems. As the investigation grew in scope and scale, it quickly became the largest murder investigation in German history. It was comparable to the Jean Benet Ramsey investigation in the US, or the Madeleine McCann investigation in Great Britain. The entire country was positively obsessed with the murder, and the unfolding investigation ate up airtime on the nightly news, as well as pervading the dinner table conversations of almost every family in the nation. Police officers took fingerprints from a jaw-dropping 10,000 male suspects in the months that followed, as well as collating around 24,000 witness statements. They also had a number of composite sketches made, each detailing what they believed the killer might look like, and had these distributed to more than 80 different German prisons. Even Germany's criminals were appalled by Tristan's murder, and entire swaths of criminal organizations promised to do all they could to catch his killer. Police also reached out to various medical clinics, hoping to match up the hair-lip detail with any potential patients. Officers then interviewed almost every single person who'd had a hair-lip repair operation during their youth, but none were considered potential suspects following these interviews. The investigation slowed until March of 1999, when police made their second solid break in the case. Tristan's backpack, a different item to his school bag which had been missing from the scene of his murder, was finally located. It was lying in a wooded area around 16 miles from the scene of the crime, and perhaps most interesting was the fact that it contained a Czech language roadmap of Germany. Tristan didn't speak or read Czech, so it was safe to say it didn't belong to him and most likely belonged to his killer. The release of this new information to the public prompted yet another eyewitness to come forward, one who claimed that she had been walking through these same woods the day after Tristan was murdered. During her walk, she had been accosted by a man who seemed mentally unstable, one who was ranting about the French Foreign Legion as well as a herd of lost sheep. But more pertinently, she claimed the man not only spoke German with a Czech accent, but he was also carrying what strongly resembled a child's backpack. It seemed the police were only a hair's breadth away from catching the killer, but when the man was tracked down with the help of the French Foreign Legion, it was discovered he had a solid alibi and had to be ruled out of any subsequent investigations. By that time, an entire year had passed since Tristan's murder, but to the investigators' frustration, they were no closer to solving his murder than they were the year before. Lead after lead took them to nothing but dead ends, and the case was dangerously close to becoming a cold one. Then in October of 1999, Tristan's grandmother paid a visit to the young man's grave, only to make a truly terrifying discovery. We can only imagine the anguish and horror she felt when she walked up to her grandson's grave to find that someone had tried to dig him up. Whoever it was had laid down a plastic tarp and had excavated so much earth from Tristan's grave that they'd almost reached his coffin. What's more, a single shovel lay next to the excavated earth, and although a lack of recent rain meant that it was near impossible to tell when the grave had been disturbed, Tristan's grandmother insisted she had the feeling of being watched, and that she'd interrupted the grave robber's grim endeavor. Investigators were baffled by this bizarre and horrifying twist in the tale, and Despite the Brubach family insisting that the killer was to blame, there was no way of telling who might undertake such a grisly task. In the years that followed Tristan's murder, the lack of a solid explanation led to a number of vicious rumors being circulated, none of which warrant discussion in this video. However, it's clear that the longer the case went without answers, the less funding and focus it received, and as the days went by, the closer Tristan's case got to being tossed on the cold pile. This was further exacerbated by the revelation that one of the case's major tipsters turned out to be an American woman who was trying to implicate her innocent ex-husband as the killer. It turned out she had been lying to investigators for months on end, meaning tons of potential evidence had to be scrapped from the Frankfurt police. Yet, all was not in vain as police began to find links between Tristan's murder and the disappearance of two other German children, 
Annika Seidel and Melanie Frank. In September of 1996, 11-year-old Annika Seidel disappeared from a location just six miles away from where Tristan's body was found, while 13-year-old Melanie Frank disappeared from nearby Wiesbaden just over a year after Tristan was killed. Some investigators suggested that the case was intrinsically linked, and if they found the person responsible for either child's disappearance, they would also solve the death of Tristan. It took until 2013 for investigators to take a fresh look at the case, and since then, two dominant theories have emerged. The first is that Tristan had been lured to the Liederbach tunnel by someone he knew, possibly with the promise of some kind of material gain. It's possible that the person that did so was someone Tristan's father wouldn't have approved of, hence why he tried to come up with an excuse to get out of going to school that day. One of the worst pieces of evidence for this was a statement provided by one of Tristan's teachers, who described seeing him in the company of a few older men in the weeks prior to his death. One of these men seemed to fit the description of the suspects seen by other eyewitnesses, the blonde-haired man with the hair lip who was sighted near the crime scene just after the murder. When the police tried to put together a timeline of Tristan's movements in the days prior to his murder, they noted that there were large gaps that no one could account for. Was Tristan perhaps taking drugs with this grimy, pale-looking man? Perhaps he owed him money or had stolen something from him. Little else, besides devastating mental illness, could explain the brutal malice of such a grisly attack. The second dominant theory is that Tristan had been targeted by an apparent child predator that had been stalking the area. One of Tristan's former classmates would later describe a man who looked exactly like the police sketch of Tristan's killer, and added that he was an intimidating individual who was known to stalk and offer gifts to local children. This was then backed up by the testimony of children from a local daycare center who told police of a man lurking in a nearby wooded area. Every time they were offered gifts, the children had rushed to report this behavior, but it wasn't until Tristan was murdered that their teachers began to take their claims seriously. Yet by the time Tristan was murdered, this strange man had disappeared, and any and all searches for him were completely fruitless. Sadly, to this day, Tristan Brubach's murder remains unsolved. Investigators in Germany have attempted to link Tristan's case with murders and assaults in a variety of other European countries, but no concrete parallels have been established. Tristan's only surviving relative, Bernd Brubach, passed away in December of 2014 at the age of 59, having never remarried or had any other children. At the time of his death, he remained hopeful that his son's murderer would be found, but despite the fact that a 20,000 euro reward had been offered for any information leading to the killer's capture, it seems increasingly likely that hope was painfully misplaced. In the decades that followed, the murder has continued to loom over Frankfurt's citizenry, so much so that the Liederbach tunnel had been completely closed off to the general public, and as time's gone by, the murder had transformed from a well-discussed fact into something of an urban legend something teenagers use to scare each other. Be wary, be watchful of the Liederbach Phantom. Born in 1957, as the only daughter of George Whittle and his girlfriend Dorothy, Leslie Whittle grew up in the English city of Wolverhampton, and would go on to enroll as a student at the town's Wolfram College. George Whittle was the owner and operator of Whittle Coaches, a successful transport company that specialized in ferrying miners from the home's villages to the coal pits they employed them at. The coach company earned additional money by hauling coal in between shift changes, and by 1970, Whittle Coaches was one of the most profitable private enterprises in the entire region. However, in that same year, 65-year-old George tragically passed away after a sudden illness. To avoid estate taxes, he gave three houses and 70 grand in cash to Dorothy, as well as over 190,000 pounds to both of his children, which obviously included Leslie. Yet Selina Whittle, his estranged wife, received absolutely nothing from George's last will and testament, 
and this kicked off some much publicized legal proceedings that circulated in the nation's newspapers. Tens of thousands of everyday people were transfixed by the sordid details of the litigative battle, yet one malevolent person was far more interested in the stories than their peers. And in their dark and twisted mind, a plan began to form. On January 14th of 1975, Dorothy, who by then had adopted her deceased husband's second name, returned to her home in Shropshire at around 1.30 in the morning. Shortly after entering the house, Dorothy quietly checked in on her daughter Leslie and after finding her fast asleep, Dorothy also retired to bed. Yet as she slowly drifted off to sleep, she had no idea of the horrors that were to befall her young family when she awoke the following morning. Not long after dawn on Wednesday, January 15th, Dorothy rolled out of bed, trudged downstairs, and began cooking breakfast for her two children. It wasn't unusual for Leslie to sleep in, even on a school day, but as she began to get dangerously close to being late for college, Dorothy climbed the stairs with the intention of waking her. But when she walked into her daughter's bedroom, Leslie was nowhere to be found, and in her place was a typewritten note. Dorothy knew something was horribly wrong as she read the first few words, which told her that under no circumstances was she to contact the police. Leslie had been kidnapped, and the only way to get her back was via a payment of £50,000. In order to facilitate the transaction, she was to wait for a telephone call that evening, one that would come to a payphone near the Swan Shopping Center in Kidderminster. Dorothy descended into a wild panic and drove over to her stepson Ronald's house. When he heard the news, Ronald completely ignored the ransom note's demands and immediately contacted the local police force. Late that evening and early the next morning, a team led by Commander John Morrison and Detective Chief Inspector Walter Borham began an investigation into the kidnapping. But somehow, the story was almost immediately leaked to the British press, and a feature on Leslie's kidnapping was featured on the nightly news on the very same day she was taken. By some miracle, the broadcast didn't deter the mysterious kidnapper, but they waited until 1am on January 16th to make the phone call to the shopping center's payphone. During the call, Leslie's voice could be heard, assuring her family she was okay. Yet she also passed along instructions that the family needed to visit another payphone in nearby Kids Grove in order to retrieve a second message that had been stuffed behind the payphone's backboard. It was during the second trip that the family was ordered to bring along full payment of £50,000 or a terrible fate would befall Leslie. After collecting the full cash amount, Ronald Whittle departed from Bridge North Police Station just after 1.30 a.m. on January 17th. Yet Ronald was unfamiliar with the area Kids Grove and in the search for the correct payphone, he quickly became lost. It took him almost 30 minutes to locate the payphone which was located just outside the Kids Grove post office. There was indeed a typewritten message stuffed behind the backboard, one that directed him to a piece of nearby parkland known as Bathpool Park. The rest of the message has been paraphrased as follows. Go to the top of the lane and turn into no entry. Go the wall and flash your car flights. Look for the torchlight run, then await further instructions. Ronald followed the instructions to the letter, driving down a pathway which was marked with a no entry sign. He drove to the end of the lane, flashed his car lights, and exited the vehicle to await fresh commands, yet no one appeared. As it turned out, a young couple had parked their car right next to the proposed ransom drop, and in the confusion, the kidnapper seems to have fled the area. The entire Whittle family was panic-stricken by the failure, and were terrified that Leslie would in turn suffer the consequences. Yet all they could do was wait to be contacted by the mysterious kidnapper, praying all the while that Leslie would survive the ordeal. Police officers assured them that the kidnapper would not harm Leslie, as she was far more valuable alive than dead. But still the Whittles worried, having no idea if the person they were dealing with was just greedy or pure evil. 
Around a week after the failed ransom drop, West Mercia police were contacted by their West Midlands counterparts. They informed them that the same night as the ransom drop, a car had been abandoned near the Freightliner terminal in the town of Dudley. The terminal's security guard had been shot in the back six times and was in critical condition in the hospital, while the car itself contained a pair of slippers that were confirmed to be Leslie Whittle's. The shooting of the security guard appeared to have been a statement from the kidnapper, one designed to assure the Whittles that he was not afraid to use violence to achieve his goals. But as it turned out, the fingerprints and ballistic evidence left behind by the kidnapper were a far louder statement than any bloodshed. The fingerprints were the exact same pattern that were found at the scenes of three other slayings committed by a man who the British press referred to as the Black Panther. During a series of post office robberies, the Panther shot dead two postmasters and the husband of a postmistress, and earned his nickname due to his dark clothing and frightening agility. This new information only served to further terrify the Whittle family, who realized that they were dealing with no mere amateur, but a hardened, remorseless killer. Just days after the shooting of the security guard, the police decided to hold a press conference to inform the general public of Leslie's kidnapping. They knew that Leslie's kidnapper had strictly forbidden her family from contacting law enforcement, but seemed convinced that he would refrain from hurting her. In light of this, high-ranking officers ordered a thorough search of Bathpool Park, the site of the proposed ransom drop. The search began on March 6th of 1975, and since a roll of Dymo tape typing paper had been found stuffed into an old sewer drain, police continued to inspect the other sewage drains present in the park. The deepest of all the drains happened to once serve as an air ventilation shaft for Nelson's coal mine and had to be tested for poisonous gases. But once it was declared safe to enter, officers of the West Mercian Police Force descended into the darkness to search for clues. The drain consisted of three steep landings, and on the second, the search team discovered a cassette tape recorder, the same variety used to create the proof-of-life tapes of Leslie's voice. Then on the third landing, the search team discovered a rolled-up sleeping bag that was acting as a pillow, a yellow foam mattress, and a survival blanket. Yet it was only near the bottom of the drain that the search team made the most horrifying and heart-wrenching discovery. Hanging from a thick steel wire, a mere seven inches from the bottom of the drainage shaft, was Leslie Whittle's cold and clammy corpse. It was widely accepted that once Leslie's kidnapping was made public, and it became obvious that the police were involved, her kidnapper had simply executed her by tying the wire around her neck and pushing her off the third and final landing. In the aftermath of Leslie's brutal execution, her kidnapper became the United Kingdom's most wanted man. A huge manhunt commenced and soon, the hunter's net began to tighten around this murderous defiler. Towards the end of the year, in December of 1975, two police officers spotted a man acting suspiciously in the large market town of Mansfield. When they approached him, the man produced a sawn-off shotgun firing it into the air before he rushed off into a nearby fish and chip shop to take hostages. However, the brave patrons of the traditional eatery quickly overpowered their potential captor, and the man discovered to be one Donald Nielsen was taken into custody. In the investigation that followed, Nielsen's fingerprints were found to match those in the drain shaft, and later, at Kids Grove Police Station, Nielsen confessed to Leslie's kidnap but not to her murder. During his trial at Oxford Crown Court, Nielsen's defense attorney proposed that Leslie had in fact killed herself accidentally after slipping and falling from the ledge while the metal wire was around her neck. This wire was supposed to secure her, not hang her, and it was argued that Nielsen had showed a great deal of compassion for his victim by feeding her, clothing her, and providing a place for her to sleep. However, this argument failed to convince the jury, and in July of the following year, Nielsen was found guilty of Leslie's murder, with the judge handing him a life sentence of 61 years in prison. 
It was during this time that he was further identified as the so-called Black Panther, and three weeks later, he was convicted of the murder of three post office workers and handed a further three life sentences. Nielsen was never released from prison, as he died of motor neuron disease in his prison's hospital in December of 2011. It was an apt way for him to die, as just like his victim, his life slipped away while unable to move, unable to breathe, and unable to cry out for mercy. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, the Alamo.